So today we are doing <clears throat> communion. And I just thought I would go over stuff. I was going to do a, a sermon on the Apostle Peter. And then Pastor Carter called yesterday and I said, hey, you mind if I change that to a sermon on communion in the Last Supper? And he goes, oh yeah, please do it. So I'm doing it. First of all, everybody knows here why they celebrate Passover. Does anyone, everyone know? <clears throat> if you recall in the Bible in the Old Testament, um, Moses was told to tell everyone to put blood over their door and the angel of the Lord would pass over that house. That's where they come up with Passover. So don't forget to go kill an unblemished lamb. I'm kidding. But that is where Passover comes from. So we're going to talk about a place of communion first. <clears throat> and our theme is going to be the upper room, a place of communion. So there are four observations that I want to do and talk about about the Last Supper. And I'll try to do this quick. I know that a lot of people here have 4-H that their kids are in. So we're going to do this this morning. I'll run through it. But it was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There was an eight-day feast that began with the observation of Passover. We know what that is now. Therefore, it was really two feasts combined. So there was much preparation that had to be done to observe the feast. <clears throat> the, the disciples inquired of Jesus <clears throat> where they should go to observe the feast so that they could begin the preparations. Jesus tells them that there's a certain man in the city that they are going to go and inform him that his time is at hand. Now, this was probably an unknown person that followed Jesus with whom Jesus already made these preparations. In Luke 22, 9, 13, it says, Where do you want us to prepare for it? Jesus replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparation there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told him. So they discovered the Passover. <clears throat> now, in order not to tip his hand to Judas, Jesus gives the instructions that we're to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water and then follow him home. Now, we may not think that this direction would be very clear, but remember, carrying water was regarded as a woman's work, not a man's work. In Old Testament biblical, the women were the one that carried the water. So this was going to be a hard task, right? So a man carrying would stand out like a sore thumb. A sore thumb? Sore thumb. And I'm trying to learn her you something. I can't even speak. I feel like Jethro Bodine up here sometimes. So, the only men in the Old Testament time in Jerusalem and Nazareth and, and that area at the time that carried water were a group of men called the Essenes. And there were, there were numerous Essenes back then, but it was very rare for them to be seen during that time carrying water. So, Jesus made it a point to say, find a man carrying water. So Jesus wanted his final evening with his disciples to be trouble-free. No need to let Judas know where they'll be celebrating and allow him to bring the arresting soldiers there to the upper room. So I'm going to go a little bit further. So it says, uh, They would obtain unleavened bread, spices, fruit, wine, and the sacrificial lamb. A bowl of salt water. To remind them of the many tears shed by the people once they were slaves in Egypt, and of the salty waters of the Red Sea which God had parted in order they might enter the promised land. A bunch of bitter herbs would be gathered to remind them both of the herbs used to smear the lamb's blood over the door, and also the bitterness of slavery. A paste was made from apples, dates, pomegranates, and nuts strangely to remind them 
from uh, they were, it was formed in a clay to remind them that they had been required to make bricks in Egypt. And through the sticks, a piece of cinnamon was placed to remind them of the straw that they had to make. So everything at the Last Supper, Jesus made sure was symbolic from the Old Testament to make it worthy of the New Testament. You following me? So they made their dip out of things that, that was formed into the clay with the cinnamon straw to remind them, or the cinnamon stick to remind them of straw. The salt water to remind them of the Red Sea and the, yes, the tears. So Jesus was very thorough with what he was going to do, do it, what he was doing to try to eliminate any debate that people could have in reference to the Last Supper and the communion. This is supposed to be a special time, not a divided time. Amen? The borrowed room had to be searched for any trace of yeast. Any crumb of bread had to be removed. Yeast ref represented the evil, evil influence of Egypt that the Jews were leaving behind at the Exodus. Yeast came to be known as the influence of sin. That's why it was unleavened at the time. Just as the disciples had to prepare for the Passover meal, so must we prepare for the Lord's Supper. We are to observe the Lord's Supper, according to Paul, with a prepared heart. Paul said, we are not to observe the supper in an unworthy manner. We are to come to the table with hearts prepared. The yeast of sin must be removed from our lives through confession and repentance, and then Jesus promises to forgive us and remove the sin from our record. Paul said, let a man examine himself. You are not to enter highly lightly of the observation of the Lord's Supper. Jesus interrupted the mail with a startling statement. He said, one of you will betray me. Now the disciples have been told by Jesus that he would be delivered up, but they had not been told before that it would be one of their numbered. When faced with the news, the disciples were cut to the heart. Each man began to question himself. Now here, here's another saying that if, if you study the Bible at all, you'll find out there, there are certain things that happened at the Last Supper that you know that the disciples just were really aghast at each other after it happened. They all wanted to know at this time, who was Jesus' favorite? Who's, who's your, am I your favorite? Am I his favorite? We are all his favorite. We've all been, we've all been given the same gift of repentance and baptism and and to be free completely of our sins. We've been given a new lease on life if we'll accept it. Jesus doesn't play favoritisms. Jesus treated Judas like he treated everybody else. And Jesus knew Judas had sold him for 30 pieces of coins, silver coins. And you want to know something else ironic about that? Do you remember when, when they... She washed the feet of Jesus, and Judas says, isn't that worth 60 pieces of silver? Judas sold Christ for half of what it cost to anoint his feet. Think about that. He complained the oil could be worth 60 silver coins, but yet he sold Jesus for 30. Things you never thought about, huh? The disciples would have looked at each other, pointing their fingers, but Jesus already knew, and he allowed the other disciples to see the frailty of his own nature, which is always healthy. Our nature is healthy if we allowed Christ to guide us. Again, Jesus was loving to Judas to the end. Perhaps we see the difference between self-doubt and true conviction. There was one here that he knew was not being real, the others doubted, they questioned, they dreaded the possibility of it being them. Could you imagine Jesus sitting here, and you're on the floor on a table, and Jesus says that one of you will betray me, and that you have so much self-doubt in yourself, you're going, could it be me? Could it be? 
Jesus already knew who it was. I believe, believe real conviction that comes from God leaves no room for doubt or question. It's precise. And the convicted knows that the Lord has placed his anointed finger on their lives. That, my friends, is called complete conversion. Complete conversion into submitting to the will of an almighty God. Amen? Judas appeals to Jude, or Jesus appeals to Judas first from the perspective of love and friendship. The Passover meal was be, to be observed by families. We're a family. According to Exodus, the book of Exodus, this band of disciples had become a family with their Lord at the head. Somebody said, do you have to go to church to go to heaven? There's really nothing in the Bible that specifically says that, but it says to congregate. It says to get with other people in the body of Christ. This church and us, me as your pastor, we are family. That's what this is for. For, for all the pastors here, everybody sitting in a pew, the people that are out sick today that called me, the people that text, the people that are on vacation because they wanted to camp. Camp smamp. I shouldn't say anything. I'm going to be gone. Enjoy yourself camping. <laughs> the psalmist describes this awful betrayal. Now listen to this. The psalmist describes this awful betrayal in Psalms. Old Testament, 41. My, old, my own familiar friend and whom I trusted which did I eat of my bread, had lifted his heel against me. That's Judas giving Jesus to the high priest. Even to this day in the Middle East, when you break bread and share a meal together, there is a covenant of bond, of friendship, and trust that's established. Therefore, Jesus identified the betrayer who was said to have bread with him. He was appealing to Judas in love and in friendship. Jesus says, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Christ warns Judas of the consequences of a lack of what he is doing. Finally, there's a direct identification of Judas by Christ, as Judas asks, in pretense like the other disciples, Rabbi, is it I? Jesus said, you have said so. We see Judas is the problem. But Judas also was part of our solution. You don't understand that yet, but you will. The Lord, by his statement of his betrayal, caused each disciple to examine the nature of the commitment to him. Jesus was trying to tell them, love, love, love. Earlier, as they were sitting at the Last Supper, Jesus gave them the greater commandment. I tell you, love your neighbor as your friend. Love. That's what one of the final things Jesus ever tried to stress was love, love, love. Because without love, there is no kingdom. Amen? Fitting a covenant. Jesus again interrupts the Passover meal. This time he interrupts it in order to transform it into a sacrament of the Lord's Supper. At the point of the drinking of the third cup of wine in the traditional ceremony, he takes the bread and tells his disciple that this bread now becomes his body. The bread is a symbol of sustenance. Jesus said, my body, my life that I have lived and that I will give is now being offered to you so that you may live. He takes the cup of wine and he says, this wine now becomes his blood, which is shed for so many of the remission of sins. Remission means release. The shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross was so that his disciples might experience release of the penalty of sin. His bleeding and dying purchased our forgiveness and our righteousness and our chance for ultimate salvation and to see God on his throne in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Now there's another significant impact to this, aspect to it. 
When Jesus spoke these words, where we are also familiar with this, would have greatly surprised the disciples. These they are the similar to the words spoken by the groom as he proposes to his bride. In Jewish tradition, when a young man w- wishes to marry a maiden, he will take a cup of wine and offer it to her. By this he is saying. I am offering you my blood, my life, my future, and all that I have to give to you. He can only offer that in the marriage. What we are going to do today is being offered by Christ himself. This is my blood. This is my body. And remember what the Bible also says. Man cannot live by just bread. Amen? As we drink the cup from Jesus this morning, we as a member of the church are a part of the bride of Christ, accepting Jesus' offer and making our response to his eternal commitment to us. We are entering into a covenant agreement with him, and we are called by that covenant of grace. We are under grace. The disciples were to take and receive the bread, which becomes the body of Christ, and to drink the wine, which becomes the blood, The words were sometimes used how to explain uh, are in with the under. The Jesus body and blood are in with the under of bread and wine. It's spiritual. It's faithful. And it is one of the final commitments that you will make from repentance, baptism, communion. This reminds us of the wonderful truth that we have that we may have life and forgiveness and release from the power of sin by receiving taking by faith Christ's life and blood given on our behalf this is the new covenant that we have for our God our father that we remember to celebrate this afternoon with pastor Carter leading this is the strength that we must continue to feed upon Christ's life and to make his blood not meaningless, but let us feel the power of the stripes and the blood and what happened on Calvary, what happened in that tomb, and what happened at the resurrection. This meal would be observed with the disciples again in the Father's kingdom, according to Jesus. The fellowship would continue. This implies Christ's resurrection, which he had predicted many times, the fellowship would be restored. In addition, because he was resurrected, so shall we be to be with him. I believe we will feast with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. John wrote in Revelation, blessed are which are called to the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We observe the supper this afternoon in anticipation of that day in which Christ returns for his bride to fellowship with him forever. It's a wonderful, wonderful time for church. It's something that's supposed to be um, sentimental. It's something that's supposed to be faithful. It's something that's supposed to be uh, enjoyed. And it's something that's supposed to be shared. It's supposed to be an event. It's like Christmas coming early. This is supposed to bring a congregation together in the body and the blood of Christ through everything that he did and the debt that he paid in full. He did this for us. Right now, this morning, we will honor our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for what he's done. And if Jesus was here, he'd say, And he is here. This is God's house.